Welcome to the Cowboy Office Show, where you'll experience expert analysis and epic discussion on key pillars of the equine industry, including sports, business, hobby, and the horse lifestyle. Your co-hosts are Jody Brainerd and Brian Dykert, industry veterans with over 120 years combined living the cowboy lifestyle. The Cowboy Office Show will help you get involved, ask more questions, and create change. We'll keep riding for you as together we learn from the ride already ridden, learn to listen better to our horse, and make our industry better for all. Each weekly episode, we'll take a ride around the industry in less time than you can load the truck and trailer. Drop your email at cowboyoffice.com to receive weekly updates and never miss an episode. Settle up as we ride into today's show. Well, welcome to the Cowboy Office. I'm Brian. We have a great episode for you, and we have Chelsea Sutton from the Consultant Agency to moderate for us today as well. Well, hey, and I am Jody, and we are so happy to have everyone here on this episode with us. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to be discussing some officiating today, uh, reigning officiating to be specific, and uh, what goes into that judge's decision making and maneuver evaluation, standards, degree of difficulty, pattern placement, all of the above. What makes that judge mark the run like he does? And we're going to use the 2022 futurity data um, to uh, to come up with this show. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Always an honor to be with you. We have some really cool graphs of analytical data from the 22 Futurity, Reigning Futurity, held in Oklahoma City by the National Reigning Horse Association that I would love to pull up and look at. Because specifically today, we're going to have you guys as judges, experts, monitors, horsemen, analyze and help us understand how maneuver spreads happen, particularly across a particular maneuver score. And so let's look at the data first, and then we'll dive in to some analysis. Brian, how about I have you talk us through this first graph. Um, For those of you guys that are tuning in an audio format, a reminder that you can uh, log on through YouTube or Spotify to see these visual, but we'll talk you through the numbers while we're here. We will. Um, yes, this is simple data across the open fraternity. First go semifinals and finals. And what it shows is one is the total number of runs. But then we specifically pulled out the number of runs that have maneuver spreads from minus half to plus half. And then compared that to the maneuver evaluation, the number of runs that have maneuver spreads of one point or more. So on this graph, the first go, you have 71 runs of 406 that have maneuver spreads from minus half to plus half, which is us as an industry saying it's bad and good at the same time. So there's a big problem there. 71 of 107 total runs in the go round that had maneuver spreads of one point or more. Then the... Next set of numbers is the semifinals. You had 177 uh, runs in the semifinals, two sections. You had 17 runs of 177 that had maneuver spreads from minus half to plus half. And then you had 23 runs that had maneuver spreads that were one point or more. And when we step into the finals, you had 96 total runs, two sections, You had 20 runs, 20 of 96 runs that had maneuver spreads from minus half to plus half. And you had 34 runs of 96 that had a maneuver spread of one point or more. And just to create some clarification on these graphs, when we're looking at the bars, the blue bar showing total runs represents just that. The yellow bar represents all all maneuver evaluations of maneuver scores that have a differential of more than one point. And the red representing those from minus half to plus half is included in that yellow bar. So for example, in the first go, there were 107 runs of the total 406 runs, which is about 25%, that had maneuver spreads of one point or more. 71 of those 107 had maneuver spreads across the minus half to plus half spread. That's correct. 
Yes. And let me take us back just a little bit for any new viewers that haven't listened to Brian and Jody before. Um, in in the industry, even the working Western industry, beyond reigning, oftentimes the conversation is, oh my gosh, I'm seeing a 71 and a 73. There's That's crazy. How can you be two points different on your total score? What we're actually talking about today is not that total score difference. We are talking about the difference within a particular maneuver. So maneuver one, the stop and back, had a spread of one point or more. The circles had a spread of one point or more. For our audience, um, Jody, I'll throw this question to you. Can you explain why it's important to look at the spread on a maneuver as compared to the total spread at the end of a score? Well, if I if I if I'm understanding the question that you're asking is is it why is it more important to look at the individual maneuver evaluations as opposed to the finish score? Is that where what the question was? That's correct. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, I you know I think first of all from and I can I speak at this from from a guy who's chaired the committee just like your father has and you know who's you know had had the opportunity to judge for a, a long long time and. And also somebody that's shown a lot of horses and, and, you know, obviously when you're competing and your living depends on it, you want the officiating to be as accurate as it possibly can. Right. So anyway, any time that, you know, and, you know, my my deal was when I chaired the committee is, you know, to oversimplify things, it was to make sure that the right checks go to the right people. Right. So in other words, that's whoever, whoever's supposed to win the money is supposed to win the money. And when you get, when you get those big spreads, like, you know, we were just talking about that our, our charts just showed us just wonderful example of it. Um, it has to start with maneuver evaluation before you get to the total. I mean, that's, that, that's where the, that's where it comes from. And whenever I see, some judge calling a a maneuver poor and someone calling it good or someone calling it, you know, correct. And someone saying it's very good or excellent. Those are, you know, we, we always try to teach that there are two possible spots for a maneuver evaluation. If there's not any penalty penalty application included, because sometimes that can have a bearing on it, but yeah, it's that maneuver evaluation, each individual, that's where it starts. And, and whenever I see those, you know, someone calling it poor, someone calling it good, I need to know why. I mean, because in, in, for me, that's not supposed to happen. So, and the only way that I can, that I could ensure that my teaching is, is doing a better job is to, is to understand why that happened. And like I said, I, I don't believe it. I don't believe that it should just a personal opinion. Well, and yes, and we're all allowed to have those personal opinions, but then if we look at the sport a little bit bigger, the fact that it is, you know, somewhat significantly happening, happening, aren't there things that we could be doing to minimize that? Because the spread, I, and I, I agree with you, Jode, on the, the spread, it, you make reference to on the proper side of zero, which is correct. So anything that's better than correct or less than correct, that's kind of like okay and that's where the whole world should be. But then how can we say it's bad and good at the same time? And here we are in 2022 seeing 400 phenomenal three-year-olds and, and we're seeing it's good and bad at the same time. So how do we, how do we as a sport and an industry minimize that? Well, and one of the things I want to point out as we dig into how that happens Um, how we can maybe make it better is the idea that um, I love that you guys are doing a talk specifically on maneuver spreads because as an industry, sometimes we see the total score because that's what's put up on the jumbotron or that's what gets announced by us as announcers at the end. And we're like, Oh my gosh, two point difference. How can that happen? But just as you said a moment ago, Jody, there's typically some, there's sometimes two boxes. You could be correct or good, or you could be good or very good, depending on a judge's individual standard or a judge's evaluation of it. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Well, if you do that across four maneuvers and you, that, there's two points right there and nobody's wrong. Nobody's had an error there where I think this talk is so valuable for our industry um, to have and to have amongst judges and professionals is 
let's look at spreads at a maneuver level because that is, you know, when you have a judge saying that's poor and a, a judge on the same maneuver say that that's good, well, that's a mixed signal. We're, we're saying something to the exhibitor and to the spectator that are contradictory. So having a spread across a maneuver is more important to look at than having a spread at the end of a run, right? Um, Correct. And so, Correct. again, I mentioned this. Um, to me, I'm always fascinated. You know, I was talking to a, a trainer's parent recently on social media, and she was she was talking about the, you know, quote unquote, poor judging that was happening at an event. And she was using her her daughter's ride as an example. And she was talking about the, the total score spread. And when I asked about where which maneuvers were having a maneuver spread, because now we can actually analyze where the challenges were coming in. She didn't she didn't know. Right. I don't even know if she had looked yet. Um, and so to me, as an industry, whether we are exhibitors, whether we are viewers, spectators, et cetera, looking at what maneuver these spreads are happening on is going to be a really important piece of understanding what's going on. And I know we're going to do another talk in the future on maneuvers that often see these spreads, such as rollbacks and circles, right? So that'll that'll be coming in the future. But just as a baseline, let's talk about, you know, if we're going to talk about spreads across a maneuver, let's talk about the standardization that exists within a maneuver score, right? Because you've got um, you've got a zero denoting correct, and then you've got the positive and negative side of that happening. Jody, can you speak to where our industry standard comes from, or where standardization comes from, and sort of the state of it in the industry? Um, because understanding that first, I think, is imperative to then understanding where the spread happens. Wait, yes, and we do. I mean, that's a it's, it's a it's a pretty easy question to answer because it comes from judges committee. And judges committee is made up of many professionals throughout the, the, the reigning horse business. So those are the guys that are deciding um, that are on committee that, yes, this is a good maneuver. This is a poor maneuver. And that's what those maneuver evaluation DVDs that committee puts out are for. And, you know, those are used uh, when they teach the judges schools, but they come from the professionals who are judges and guys that are that are taking an active part of the industry and actually making their living at it. So it uh, I mean, that's where that's where it starts. And the, actually, those are the guys that are responsible for 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 the judging. Do you guys talk to me about standardization across the levels of our industry, a green rainer zero correct versus a um, non-pro zero or correct versus a level four open finals zero or correct. Are those all the same? No. And I'll, I'll jump on this one first. And so, uh, cause I've been a proponent on this for a number of years and plenty of people think that I'm completely crazy, but <laughs> might be, <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> uh, This, the answer is no, and there's, there's, I would tell you that there's always two standards. But with the question that you just asked, that would then, now you're talking about a standard per level of competition. But there's still two standards, one coming from the association. So where's the standard in a non-pro? Where's the standard in a youth reigning? Where's the standard in a limited non-pro? Where's the standard in rookie open and where's the standard on the open open i mean every one of those le depths of competition levels of competition would have a standard coming from the industry that jody's correct and that's you know it comes from the committee and but i would then tell us as an industry we do a pretty poor job of educating ourselves because do we distribute that standard does it get to the exhibitors does everybody get the same info mm -hmm. and then how is that applied across 12 months and 400 competitions and my second answer so you have a standard per competition which comes from the association and then you have a standard per expert which is every judge every official they're an expert they have a license they go through educational recertification every two years but if you if you go to judges school every other year you're only seeing the standard getting the info from the leadership every 24 months. Well, I would in 
Jody, tell me if I'm wrong, but if you looked at every two year cycle over the last 10 years, we've been moving pretty fast. We, yeah, we have indeed. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And that's a, I mean, that's a good topic. And there's some, there's some things that we can get into a little bit later if we're talking about him improving the judging. But I would, you know, I would tell you that, you know, Chelsea, when you're talking about, you know, those different maneuver evaluations from, from Green Rainers on a weekend show to, you know, to our level four open fraternity finalists, there's, there's a huge difference in, in what guys call correct. So, even though even though our judges committee will tell us that we are supposed to judge by the same standard it, it, it doesn't happen i mean it really doesn't and i'm i'm i wouldn't be just as guilty of it myself because i'm going to make a level 4 open rider that's won 4 million dollars his correct better be different than than chelsea when you're shown in the green rainer i mean it's like it's not the same <laughs> thank god okay I, Right. Yeah, well, you know, and I would I would share very there, quickly with one there. just because we passed it. This is a and maybe we can okay. I I would just get to say that you know Ollie Griffith, you is who's our good friend Brian and has been forever, used to tell a really interesting story when he would be teaching the judges schools, and it's a great one. And sometimes I'd love to have Ollie on the show to tell it himself, but he would talk about two of his rookie riders at, at a reigning on the East Coast somewhere. And, you know, you've heard me say that, you know, whoever the high judge is is a smart one and whoever the low one is is a dumbass. But anyway, <laughs> what, what, what he said is one of his girls that showed in a rookie reigning, you know, came back to him and said, you know, this judge is really smart. He is the one that marked me a 72 and the other guy had me marked a 71 or a 70 and a half. And, you know, she was railing about that, you know, the two judges and the one was right. And, Ollie said he went over and checked the scorecards and he said, you know, the 71 and a half had her winning it and the 72 and a half had her being third or fourth. So, you know, who was the best judge in that case, right? So sometimes they get a look at that overall score and who's it's relative to where you are in position, right? So anyway, just to, something to throw in there when you're talking about the difference between maneuver evaluations and total scores. Which is about the... Uh, uh, distributing the prize money it which sure. is about placement of competition and ultimately that's what you're after that competition is being decided upon who's the best now you know whether you're first second third 15th whether you got a million dollar check or a hundred thousand dollar check or a one dollar check mm -hmm. um that's what competition is actually doing i think it's a highly valid point that we as an industry don't always look at the rest of that story either so yeah there's a lot that goes into it there indeed is let me ask you this and jody i'd love to start with you on this topic can you ex explain the role of the industry's standardization right coming from the judges committee coming from competition etc and how that standard plays with a judge's individual standard. You know, you've spoken many times on and given us examples of, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, quoting you, but okay, I as a judge might like something a little bit more than another judge, or I might be offended by something a little bit more, and so I have those two boxes to work in. And you're talking about a little bit of your own individual expertise and your analysis of a maneuver. How do those two things play into um, a maneuver score and, and therefore a total score. Well, I, you know, I think, and what sometimes if we're, if we're reasoned hunting between, you know, different guys' opinions, right? I mean, and it's like, you've heard me say it before. I, I maybe am going to judge with your father and just as an example, not the way, um, and, and I, I would say I've worked with him enough that, you know, we, we pretty much are on the same page and we'll have half point differences of opinion. Um, and it happens fairly frequently and, and we can look at one another when we're judging a reigning and we'll know where we're going to be. And I'm going to go zero and I know he's going to go plus half. I know it. So, but we're in the same, we're in the same two boxes, right? I mean, we're in our, our pigeonholes. It's where we're supposed to be. I, like I said, it's, it's very difficult for me. I, I know that working with him, um, if we're judging a weekend rain and there is not going to be a single maneuver over the daytime that one of us is going to call poor and one of us is going to call good. That's not going to happen. Um, it's just because of the way that we were, that we've grown up within the industry and trained the horses and watched it evolve. So that's, that's something that's very, very important, I think. But I, I think that when, 
when that the individual judge like myself who's grown up training horses, grown up in the business, maybe I see, uh, you know, a horse that runs down there and busts it and and we're going to get into the rollbacks a little bit later on, but maybe he, he turns a little bit wide, he U-turns that rollback and, and he's rolling back to the right and I'm in chair four or chair five. Um, and Ryan's over there in one, two, or three, and he doesn't see that U-turn quite so much, right, on that rollback, right? He doesn't see that. I mean, he's got it. He's looking across the pen from it. He doesn't see a horse pick up a right hind foot. I do, and it'll bother me a half point. So it's not going to bother me a point, difference of opinion from him, and it's not going to happen, but it's going to be, it's going to be a half point. And, you know, you maybe, like I said, we've talked about this before. Maybe I like a horse that keeps his top line level when he changes leads. Maybe that doesn't bother your dad as much. So that's where those differences of opinion can come from on a maneuver evaluation standard because of guys of the horses that we've trained and what we like to see happen. It's, uh, you know, it's opinions can happen. They just don't happen. They just don't happen from good to bad on the same one. I don't know if that helps you or not, but. Sure. Brian. Oh it, yeah. Um, I, I think he hits on a couple key, uh, interesting points in there. One is the expert opinion because we actually want that. We actually lean on it. We're actually dependent on it as a sport. And so that level of officiating at the expert level, but then I would um, take us to some of, and Jody talks about working with officials on a team concept, which is as a working group, you know, what happens to us when, when you work with the same people cleaning stalls every day, you kind of figure each other out and you actually get better at cleaning stalls and you get faster and more efficient. Well, the same thing would be true in judging, and we don't do that. And then somewhat similar to that. So when you got teams of, you know, why do Jody and I have a luxury? There's probably, I don't know, 30 of us that over 30 years we've worked together enough times that you have that natural, you know, be like changing horses. You know, you've ridden horses behind or with other people. You know their ways and, you know, the way their horses were trained, and it's easier to do. Same thing. That's a that's a luxury over time that's not a conscious effort of trying to make officiating better. One is how you select teams, put teams together, let them work together. What would happen if you took the fraternity, ten judges, two sets of five, and worked with them worked with the same ten for six months or twelve months and and then do the data uh, accordingly, I think that that would be a fascinating component. And then equal to that in that team is is your coach. It's your leader. It's your monitor. You know, Jody and Ollie did a lot of it for a number of years. And so you had consistency in that monitor. You know, if I was going to be a judge and I knew Jody was my monitor, I already knew some things. Um, so all of that comes into play. I definitely want to talk about that team concept because as – not a judge, but someone in the production role, production teams are a real thing and real flow. And so I want to come back to that. But let me ask you again the same question I asked Jody in a more pointed manner, because I'm curious about your opinion on this as a, not only as a judge, but also as someone who's both been a monitor and been monitored. The role of the industry standard and the role of a judge's standard. How do you, as a judge sitting in a chair or a monitor leading a team, um, where do the, are those two things 50 50? The industry standard says this. My opinion says this. How do those two things play when you go to make a decision on? That's an interesting question. I have my own take on it, and it's going to be individual because then one is how did I sort through that coming through the industry, and then what did I do with it myself? That's going to be somewhat different than a bigger kind of how does the industry manage those things. Um, mine, I, I learned this early in my officiating career which was my opinion came last or what i liked and my preferences were last in the equation the industry came first so so whether something was good what side of zero am i going to be on was basically told to me by the industry first then i as an individual would make the fine distinctions on how good or how poor 
and I had to learn that early um, in order to get my officiating consistent over time. But that's where it comes from. So that's what I would say is that the industry's standard is first, and then my individual standard would be coming second, which is if I'm struggling, I've said this before, um, I had to teach myself when I saw two excellent spins, give them both one and a, plus one and one half. They aren't equal. They're never going to be equal. So don't look for them to be equal. What I had to teach myself was they both were excellent. So give them both plus one and a half. Boom. That's a hard lesson to learn. And, and I had to learn that myself. I, that's a hard one. And, I mean, it came from, you know, if Jody was my monitor or whatever, I'd be talking to him over dinner saying I struggled with this because they weren't equal, but I felt like I should have, but I didn't. And so, and then my mentor and coach would go, well, the next time you get there, do it. And that's what you do. And here's another question on that same topic. The rule book and what it states of a particular maneuver or of how you score it. You know, you guys are saying things about like the standard coming from the industry or the standards coming from the committee. Can you guys give me an understanding of the role of the rule book in that standard, not only in stating what a maneuver is, but in what to do with it? Sure. Well, the rule book spells it out in language, so it defines it. But so the basic standard of where correct is is spelled out in the rule book, and that doesn't change a lot. It's the visual of what that standard looks like over time, and that's what's moving. Uh, Because you have genetics and you have form to function and you have style and you have all the other exhibition things that we're doing, which are all really good. And, you know, Jody has talked about go pull up the 1992 fraternity finals when Boomer Nick wins the fraternity, and we thought that was revolutionary. And now here, you know, 1992, it was 30 years ago. It's like, God almighty. And and do that today, and you'll see over 30 years it's it's moved that fast. So the visual is, is made up because of all the things in the natural world are moving, but this – the explanation of where correct is, Jody makes the reference to, you know, I'm a, I'm a stickler on the spins. I'm not a stickler on the inside hind foot has to stay put, but I am a stickler on front end's got to be ro- revolving around a stationary hind end. So if that horse, it, horse and rider is moving north, south, east, or west during four revolutions, I'm, I'm deducting that. So I'm a stickler there. Why? Because the rule book says so. You've mentioned some phrases to me before, and I'd love for you to repeat them for the audience. And then we'll go back to the graphs. You've mentioned some phrases from the rule book about where credit is earned and where, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't have the rule book memorized in these phrases, but you shall deduct or shall remove credit. Can you give that to our audience? Do you know what I'm talking about? Of course I do. Okay. <laughs> You're looking yeah. at me like I'm crazy. No, no. It's called, it's called a general. And so, yeah. Well, it, it but yeah, go ahead. Well, that's where it is, and it's one of it's. We've all touted this that in sixty five years of the existence of the NRHA, a general was authored by um, um, Jim Willoughby, oh. and so um, it's one of the very few things that has not been changed in the rule book since the beginning, and it's one of those things that fascinates me. So I'm I'm digressing a touch only from the standpoint of historical, because, again, those guys that started it, when they, and Jody's father was part of that whole group, when they set out to get this thing started, uh, um, I get intrigued and fascinated by the vision that they had. Um, so because they did a phenomenal job at putting it down in writing and laying it out and outlining it, A general is it, and it's, it, because reigning is a control game being willingly guided and dictated to completely with little or no apparent resistance. Any deviation on his own must be considered a lack of or temporary lack of control. After deducting all faults set here within, then credit shall be given. So the first half of that paragraph is saying what it is and that you must do these things. And if 
if they happen, you must consider it a temporary lack of control. So if you steer your horse in the right circles and the horse says, wait a minute, that's a temporary lack of control. So you have to deal with that. And that's where we get into these maneuver functions because the question is, what's the degree? Um, well, the credit shall be given for smoothness, quickness, attitude, and authority while using controlled speed, which makes him more pleasing to watch to an audience. So that's where credit comes from. So now comes the rest of it, which is we have half points to work with. So you have to move up and down by half point increments. <laughs> Did I get sorry? Yes, no. Um, well, I just, that's I think great. that's all great. Go ahead, Jody. No, no, I mean, it's good. A general still fits today because it hasn't been changed because it still fits today, right? I mean, it's, and I would add one more thing that sometimes there's a huge difference of opinion. I think that, you know, credit is given at the very tail end of that for degree of difficulty and, you know, controlled speed. So sometimes we have big differences of opinion on maneuver evaluation. I mean, Jim Willoughby intended that speed thing to come after control, right? I mean, so finesse, smoothness, then we give credit for degree of difficulty. And sometimes we get our guys in trouble because they see somebody that's bouncing off the walls, but they're running 100 miles an hour, and they move that portion to the beginning of Jim Willoughby's A General instead of at the tail end of Jim <laughs> Willoughby's A General. So anyway. Controlled speed that's bad is still bad. That's yeah. That's what Jody's talking about. Or speed yeah. that's bad is still bad. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. When you it's go not controlled, it's, it's not good. It's... Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Really bad. Um, <laughs> I think that's great. And I think I've been, I grew up in the industry and I have much of a general memorized. However, I don't have all of it memorized. And I was a, I was uh, guilty of thinking that the simplized portion of a general that's on the front or back of the rule book was all of a general, and it's not. That's only a short part of it. And so for you guys as judges, you'll often throw these phrases like, um, must be considered a lack of control. You've got to know that as a judge because then you've got to do something with it. And so I just wanted you to share that with the audience because those are the kind of technical expertise that goes into what we're about to talk about when it comes to maneuver evaluations and how you get to something being deducted by these half point increments. So let's go back. I appreciate you guys uh, giving us some context there. We're going to go back to the graph. Before you go, I would just want to make one clarity for the audience because people get stuck in this because reining is a control game and a lot of it's steerability because you have to steer a horse through a reining pattern. I guess you could say you don't have to because they do a lot of bridalist stuff and blah, blah, blah. But but it is. It's a steering control game. That's what it is. Judges will get themselves in trouble because they will see exhibitors steering. That is not a bad thing. It's the horse's response to steering. And what I used in the must be considered a lack of a temporary lack of control was the fact that because he's steering to the right and the horse goes, yes, sir, I'm going with you. That is not necessarily, that's not bad. Can many times be very good because when the horse is being under control and giving you smoothness and a good attitude and quickness in response, those are all good things of steering. So I only say that because it's so common in the industry that, well, his hand's up here and he's steering. Well, he's supposed to. It's not about where the hand is. It's about, Rider asking horse to do something and horse's response. That's what we're dealing with. That's good. Coming back to these maneuver evaluation spreads. um, And we'll look at the graph that highlights them as a quantity. And then we'll move to the graph that highlights them as a statistical representation. You guys analyzed the maneuvers that had a one point or more spread and specifically looked at those that spread across minus half to plus half, which is going from, I'm using language to define these poor to then good. Um, Jody, why is this such a big deal to talk about? Because we're going to spend the rest of the episode basically talking about the maneuver spreads that are across zero. Why is this more important to talk about than other one point differentials? 
Well, and I, 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 I don't want to beat the horse to death because we've talked about it quite a bit, and I think you know I've made my opinion on on that happening. But it's so important because you know you can be a think about the industry as a whole. If you're a if you're a non professional rider, or if I'm a professional, I'm and I'm starting, and I go in and I have two judges, and I I have a left set of my left spins, and one judge calls it good, and one judge calls it poor. That means my industry standard is right out the window, and that there's a fault there somewhere. And I, I don't want to digress too much, but I like you talked about earlier. But you know, and I, I think it has to do with with the how good these horses have got. Because ten years ago, maybe we would have a plus half to minus half spread during the futurity. I'd sit there and monitor that, and we might have you know three of those over the whole horse show, and it becomes more and more of a common occurrence now. And and I, the only thing that I can say is because the horses have gotten so much better and, you know, some of the judges are still maybe, maybe stuck in a spot a while back. Maybe, you know, I don't have the answer for that. All I know is that it, it has to, it, it has to come down to education because it's, it's not, it's not possible to have, to have a room full of people tell me that, you know, um, yeah, I did a good job and the other half tell me, no, I did a bad job. I, that's why it's so important. Um, and when we see, when we see these spreads like this, it, uh, it, and especially when there's large amounts of money being handed out, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's something that needs to be fixed. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it's time that we take our officials to, uh, in point is we, we level up our riders and our horses, all that kind of stuff. And I know we've talked about this at length. But is it time that we had different levels of officials um, rather than expecting an official that's capable of going doing the weekend stuff and then capable of coming doing the aged event or run for the million or the fraternity finals? Is it time that that's a natural stare as well to where you had a smaller batch of higher educated, skilled, worked with group? that only were focused on aged events. I, I pose that as a question, Jody. Do you think we're, is it time for that? Oh, it's past time for that. And I, and I, and let me, let me be clear here because they've, you know, the, the committee is, has now rated our judges, right? I mean, we have that and, but that's not the spot that it needs to go. We've, we've talked about, I mean, I, I mean, I, I agree with, with your, you know, their most experienced judges, guys that have, you know, guys that have, uh, you know, we've had some, we've had some guys that have, you know, won a great deal of money and maybe only judged one horse show in their lifetime. So, so that's a, that's a different thing too, right? So, but we, we had a little brief discussion about this earlier, but we had talked about the team, the team concept, which is so very, very important. And I think that's where that set of judges can work together and, and for a, a very, very positive spin on officiating in our industry. And I, I'd mentioned earlier, and Chelsea, I don't know, I, you know, I knew we were going to talk about this. I don't want to jump ahead too far, but, you know, I'd, I'd mentioned that with the, the National Football League's officiating crews, they work together all the time. And, and they, they may have a little difference of opinion. Like I said, there might be a group, this group of officials that's going to judge, or I mean, officiate the, the Chicago Bears game. I said, those guys maybe will let those receivers and defensive backs battle a little bit and not call pass interference. You get the next group that's going to go together and they're going to do the Dallas Cowboy game this weekend. Those guys say, uh uh-uh, we're not letting you get away with that. Well, the players and the coaches, they know. I mean, they know this group of officials. They know what they can get away with. They know what they can't get away with. But it's a team concept and those guys that work together, it makes a huge difference. And I, I said, when I... We used to, uh, the the officiating at the Futurity, the 10 judges, they would split those groups up for the finals, okay? Say, maybe we're going to take three from this group and two from this group, and you guys are going to judge the finals. And I, I stopped that when I became chair because I felt like if a group of judges worked together for the whole week, they would do a better job judging the finals. They might not only, they have a week of experience, maybe 400 head of horses to work on, whatever, but I still feel like, those guys would do a better job than if you split the team and said, here, go give somebody a check for 250000 and, I, and I'm, I haven't worked with you all week long. 
So uh, team concept for me makes a huge difference, and that is where we can improve the quality of our major event judges, and we can also get some guys that are beginning and starter-level judges and give them the opportunity to move up. Can you guys talk a little bit about the role of the monitor in that whole thing? Because, you know, call it whatever you want, the coach, the mentor, the whatever it is that I would think that that monitor being a part of that team for more than just a few days would also be an important part of developing a team moving forward. Um, And in our industry, we have changed our monitor every major event for the last many years. Um, So does that play a role? Does it not play a role? What kind of a role does it play? Sure it does. I'd love to hear Jody's take on that. I I would say absolutely. And it is contrary to what Jody's talking about, and I agree with him. I would love to experiment and play in the industry on, you know, if you took a small group of judges and that's what you worked with for a year over multiple events, not multiple days, but now multiple events, what would that do on the performance of officiating to the depth of competition? I would love to see that and then do the analysis. But I think, of course, your coach, I mean, using the NFL, they just fired the head coach from one of the teams the day after because they're having a losing season. So, you know, I mean, they do it (laughs) mid-season. I'm I'm not trying to – but yes. So – in, in the current years, um, I haven't seen much consistency at, at the monitor level. But, yes, I would say. Jody, you? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I completely agree. But it could go, you know, I mean, there's, there's certainly more than one person capable of monitoring a major event. I mean, that's, that's the case. But um, those, you know, that, first of all, let me step back a little bit and we'll talk about that monitor's position, but we'll also talk about judges committee and, you know, and talk about the way that that thing is formed. And, you know, like I said, the judges committee is made up by a lot of professionals. And when you're on committee, um, you know, coming and teaching a school is not such a big, difficult thing, but when you're trying to find that maneuver evaluation standard that the industry uses, that is a big pain in the butt because professionals don't like to sit down and do homework. And when you have to send somebody, you know, I want you to judge these 50 runs and, you know, they want, you know, 20 guys on judges committee to judge 50 runs. And, you know, there's five of them that will always do it like right away. And then, you know, you have somebody else that maybe never does it or they judge 20 and send that back. And so it's very, very difficult sometimes to get even the judges committee group together to decide because it's a lot of work. And you know what? They're not paid for it. Right. I mean, it's like they don't they don't get paid. So and when you've got a barn full of horses, the last thing clarify, I want to do is come back in and look at you know, three and a half hours worth of, yeah. Yes. You're talking about professional. Okay. When I say professionals, I'm talking about guys that are riders, professional riders, guys that are guys that are showing and making a living, you know, in this business, the ones that are supposed to know what a zero or a plus one is. Right. So, but you know, to be able to teach that you have to have your standards. And so what we, you know, what you do over and over again is take these runs from the futurity. And I would be, I would be the the first thing I would do is I'd say, give me every one of those things that went from minus half to plus half and judges committee, you're going to look at these things. I mean, that's the stuff that's, that's very difficult to do. And so sometimes you get in a, you know, I mean, there's leadership perhaps now, maybe, you know, if there's a director of education, it's going to get better. Um, but it, you know, it was, it's, a, it's a little bit of a chore. So, um, and that can have a bearing on your monitors also. And a lot of times, you know, sometimes your best guys that are most capable of monitoring an event are working. In other words, you know, if you've got somebody that, uh, that decides that they have horses to show or they've got a trailer full of non-pros, um, you know, it, it needs to be able to pay enough to get somebody that's at the top of their game to do the job. If now, we, now you're on the business side and the economic show production, the rest of that, but that's going to go into a whole other topic that we'll get into downstream, which is um, as a sport and industry, isn't there is a spot separating officiating from the exhibitor, 
there is a place and and we're not there yet so he he brings up a valid point and the rest of that comes into the business side of it as well but also on the career and the expertise because can you be both yeah but it's rare and should you where do you put your focus and what's going to generate more income to you as an individual will then take a pick but um you know the NFL officials are not throwing the ball, catching the ball, running the ball. Right. Mm-hmm. Not that they didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. Although my understanding is many of them did only to a point, you know, most professional officials were not professional players. Right. They might've played high school or college, but they actually didn't go the professional competitor route. You have all of those. You have, you have coaches, trainers, all that stuff in professional sports. Some do, some don't. It's not any one size fits them all. It's having the door of how do you develop experts to be excelling in their field. That's where some advanced sports are way in front of us Mm -hmm. because there's head coaches that used to play the game, doesn't matter what level. There's many head coaches that didn't. They weren't actual competitors, but were involved in the game at all the levels and what gets them to this level of coaching because that set of skills is different than being the quarterback or the center or whatever. So, yeah. Can we look at the graph that breaks down the maneuver spreads by percentage? And I want to pose this question to you gentlemen. We see that in the first go as a percentage, there were 26% of the runs that had one point differential in maneuver spreads, 17 percent were maneuver spreads from minus half to plus half that's significant over half of your one point maneuver spreads were across zero semifinals it went down um, but it was still about half it went down as a number but it was still about half as a percentage a little more than half and then the finals it went up as a percentage 20 percent of all of your finals runs had spreads across minus half to plus half which is three quarters of all of your one point maneuver spreads were across zero. Let me first ask this from an analytical perspective. Does that include penalties? So if there was a half point penalty somewhere? No, this, this, this is completely independent of penalty application completely. This is only all of this that we've been talking about is one decision making process per maneuver across the entire open fraternity. That's all we've done here. Okay. Because, and I mentioned that because at the analytical level, if you were looking at scorecards, because half point, one point penalties are not required to be absolute by our current rule book, you actually could have had a bigger differential than just one point at the end score or in a particular maneuver. True. And you would have to go even farther and I could, which is, because there are times that penalty applications do adversely affect maneuver evaluation. That's true, but not always. Right. So you cannot assume the fact that whether a penalty did or did not occur had an adverse effect on maneuver. No, that's not true. Right. And I would tell you by studying it for the amount of years that Jody, Jody and I have been, but recently in the last three to four years, because we've been focused on only the aged events. So we've been following the age events across the industry for the last four plus years. Um, penalty influence on maneuver evaluation is actually going down. It is not the factor that it used to be when Jody and I were more active in the industry. It used to be common. as a That's part of the evolution of the sport and the advancement of the skills. And so that factor is actually much less than it's ever been, which is cool. When we look at the NRHA Futurity, our section of finals had a higher percentage of maneuver score spreads across minus half to plus half. We went up um, in in maneuver spreads across zero as we uh, reached our finals. To me, that's fascinating from a quality of competition perspective because we're seeing the best of the best, but we actually had our judges make more differential decisions across zero what might contribute to that happening? 
Well, I, I think that I think that there's a the contributing factor is that it's the finals, right? And and just like anything else, I, I don't care if you're you're, you're going to go out there and you're going to sit in that judge's chair to judge that level of finalists. You're excited. I mean, I sure as heck am. If I you know if I go out there and sit in a chair and I know that there's going to be a good raining, I'm I'm jacked up for it. I really am. I mean, I can't wait to mark the raining. <laughs> And just like guys that are showing horses, if you can get around that, if you can get, you know, the guys that, the guys that do the best handle the pressure the best, right? I mean, it's like they, that's, that's why they, that's why they're as good as they are. And I think sometimes that when you get, you know, if there were 4,000 people in there screaming like crazy and you got guys busting in and running as hard as they can and, you know, you're going to have some differences of opinions because you've got, you've got somebody that's a little caught up in the moment, I mean, on a, on a maneuver or two maneuvers, and you've got somebody else that's maybe, a, you know, and, I, and grumpy's not the word that I want to use, but somebody that's maybe going to be a little bit more demanding of that guy that's, you know, that's, that's won a great deal of money, and he is going to say, uh-uh, I didn't like that. And, you know, you got somebody that's going to go, oh, man, that was gee, money. Everybody's screaming. It's crazy. And it can happen. Right. I mean, that's uh, it's it's the finals and it's and it can happen. I still I still don't like to see poor and good on the same maneuver. But when you got people screaming in your ears and, you know, different angles and I mean, it's 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 possible. Well, that's that's where I think it'd be the the the. The cool opportunity is the um, pursuit to elevate it and and continue to get better. And the point is that we can now see those things more clearly. Now we've got to start to put some conscious thought into it. Um, the finals are the finals. And, and until you've been there as an exhibitor and or in the production schedule and or the officials, because everybody puckers up, it's just in their own format because – it, it it is it it is it's the best of the best and so everybody puckers up the fans are the ones that get to just enjoy it okay cool but you got to put it in a mental perspective because everybody's puckered and i think that's cool when he when jody makes that reference first because that anxiety that adrenaline that all of those things are yes everybody's puckered it's a different form um the the how can we make it better that is what I think the data is telling us, and I've been a big proponent on the depth of competition is continually growing. So it's the demand, and the demand from the competition, and now our purses. Um, and so our officiating, it's not about the expert. It's about the system and the larger function. How do we manage it? One is tools. Two, you know, Jody and I can sit around and sort out how do you move the barometer in a maneuver evaluation decision? We can sort that out for ourselves. How do you do that with 40, 50, or 400 judges? That's a different story. And that's what this is kind of saying. I think it'd be really cool to take what Jody was alluding to, his, his thoughts phenomenal on groups of expert judges keep them together over a longer period of time over more competitions and see how that goes as well as now start to identify are there some other tools that we could be using because you know the barometer of a maneuver evaluation decision is supposed to be in two boxes we're seeing it in three boxes so you know are there other ways to deal with that by bringing up the next graph, which breaks out the NRHA finals by section. I'll use this to ask another question to you guys. When we look at the finals section one, which is levels one, two, and three of the open, we saw that... Well, let me talk about this first. Yep. Because what this graph does is break out, this is only the semifinals and the finals. Because the go-round is 400 runs, everybody goes. It's just where you draw. So that takes five days to do it, four days. This specifically breaks out the semifinals and the finals because they are now broken into sections. 
which is dependent upon your level of eligibility because there's four levels. So you got four levels of open riders in two sections in the semifinals, and the same thing is true in the finals. And and we've played with this concept because in the finals, if you look at the finals, um, you had 61 horses go in the first section, which was levels one through three. And then you had the top 35 horses show up for the level four because they qualified for it. But you had some scores from level two and three that could have been carried forward. That's the complexity of that, but they actually go. And if you look at that, um, that's an interesting dimension when you start to slice it and dice it, um, which does begin to answer that equation um, and, and I'd love to get Jody's take on this because the point is, could you have one set of officials do the semi, do the final section one, and you'd been working with them for six months or a year, and a different set do section two? Um, and could that then be managed and applied so that the accuracy could deal with the depth of competition? It's a fascinating um, kind of circumstance. But that's what this graph says. Well, and let me just make sure I understand this correctly um, and that it was stated correctly. When you've got exhibitors going in Section 1, if they were qualified for the Level 4, they would have had to exhibit in Section 2. Isn't that correct? That's correct. So what's happening is exhibitors in Section 2, those 35 goes that were in the Level 4 finals, could have scores that carry through Sections 1 one through three, levels one through three, if right? If they were eligible, yes. Correct, if they were eligible. None of the scores from levels one through three would count for the four. It's actually the other way around. If they went in the four, they could carry down, right? Yeah, if they were eligible. That's yep. correct. Okay. So that being said, there were 61 horses to go in the section one set of the finals, which is levels one through three. And 14 of the 16, there were 16 of those scores that had one-point differentials, 14 of those were across... Across Minus zero. Plus mm -hmm. And in the second set of the finals, there were 35 horses to go in the level four. And six of 17. Goes down. Yes. Correct. More clear, more obvious. Depth of competitions going up. Less variance of crossing zero. Where was the variance? How good it was. That's what it says. We've talked about it before, but I think it's great to bring up on this episode, Jody, and I'll pose this to you. Thinking about the fact that section one of the finals had more cross zero variables um, than section two did for all of the reasons for which Brian just stated. And I'm going to go back to a general and just use this as a as a platform of understanding. All deviations from the exact written pattern must be considered a lack of or temporary loss. And therefore, a fault must be marked down. What are some examples for other tools? How can we get better at marking those in a way that is reflective of the rule book, must be marked down, right, or credit must be given, should we be on the plus side of, of zero, in a way that's not across zero, right, in a way that's, or it's, it's more clear to the exhibitor, because right now going from minus half to plus half, that's it's a no-no, right? We shouldn't be doing it. It's a confusing thing. What are some ideas that we could empower our our riders with and empower our judges with? Jody? Well, you know, that's a really good question. And I mean, there's, it can go, it can go so many different directions, but obviously I mean, the, the one thing that the common denominator through the whole thing, whenever you have, whenever you have guys going from, you know, poor maneuver evaluation to good maneuver evaluations, the, the fault has to lie on education. I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the, I mean, you know, if you have two or three examples of that where there's some, you know, penalty application involved and somebody, you know, hits a run or a maneuver evaluation harder than the other, I, I mean, I get it. I, I understand that degree of difficulty. I, I mean, I can, I, I can understand a few of those things, but when we get 60 or 70 of them, it's, it's not understandable. So that means that from an educational standard, those guys, when they mark that, when that judge sits in that chair and he marks them, he doesn't think he's wrong. 
I mean, I, you don't do that on purpose. You don't go minus half. And I mean, because to me, it's poor. And that guy over there that said plus half, he thinks it's good. The, the question here is, why did we each think that? And, and that education needs to be that needs to be tended to. And it's, and, and I, I think that there's probably a lack of that, or it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be growing. It would be declining. Correct. I mean, is that, does that, I mean, that's, I'm, again, I'm, I'm on the same subject, but I think education, improved education. And I, I think that when, you know, Brian and I have discussed this before and it, and it, we've talked about this and Chelsea with you too, it's, it's almost impossible to go judge a rookie reigning and then go judge an open because your, your, your frame of reference is skewed. And it's hard on guys to have to go judge level one horses and then expect them to come back that night and judge level four horses. I mean, this group of judges did an excellent job. They made it work, but it is not easy to do. And the format of the fraternity structure would have to change. In other words, the guys that qualify for the level four, you're shown in the level four. You're not shown in the one, two, or three. That's this set can have a different set of judges. I mean, there's there's ways to make it happen, but that certainly would have a huge bearing on on the way that those horses are scored in the lower levels of the futurity. I think that that's a fascinating conversation. And Jody and I will do some more work on those potentials. I think that there's a number of things. Jody and I have been studying this for 20-plus years. So when you talk about tools of the toolbox... But I think one of the biggest ones he's bringing up that, to be honest with you, I haven't put a lot of thought into, in casual I have, is, is, is and even though we have a rating system for our judges, does it work and what's it really doing? Whoa. Um, but the point, grabbing, not grabbing, identifying a group, a small group of experts and keeping them over a longer period of time and working with them in that team working group and now over a year or two years because everything we're talking about, I'm sure that group of judges and the monitors at the fraternity kind of discussed all that stuff in real time while it was going on, but now the fraternity's over. So what happens at the next competition when any one of those individuals, it's not going to be the same group. That, I think, is an absolutely fascinating conversation that would be easy in the short term. The advancing the system, making penalties absolute, I've been a big proponent because we have continued to move to review and we're using it more so. Good for all of us. Great for the exhibitor. Great for purse distribution. Great for education of the officials. Are we doing it all the time? No. Should we? Probably. I believe penalties either do or do not happen. They just do. You're either breaking the speed limit or you're not. There is no, well, kind of. No. And I don't believe in averaging on penalty applications. That's just me. The rest of it, and then, then I would tell you on data, though, because on a five, using... Is it true that more mathematical inputs give you a more distinct mathematical output? Yes, it is. So that's where I keep tossing out, is it time to start using all five judges? And should we allow the officials to lean on the fact that when you make a mistake, you might be thrown out, and so it's not that big of a deal? I'd say no. So we they need the same pressure, same responsibility the exhibitor is. Exhibitor's got to draw. He's got to pony up. He's got to do it. And when they say now, you got to go. Well, we need the same thing. We just so, anyways, it all goes there. And what about the role of of a quarter? The use of a quarter would that help us in these these one point spreads? Of course. <laughs> it's just one of. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't mean to. I mean, if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to. But you've talked about it before, and thinking about no. the concept of sure. must must credit must be given or must faults must be yes deducted. I can tell you right now that there is a need for a quarter between zero and a half and zero minus half. That's a fact, mathematically. Jody and I have proven it. We've tested it many of times. We'll do it again. Yes, that's true. Can you start to split our system up in quarters even more so? And I would, I would tell you we, we don't have the data on it, but we'll do some of this work because this fraternity, run for the million, qualifier in March for run for the million, 
and this fraternity and even the NRBC told us that the volume of high quality performers is now at an all time. It's up there. Great. Which means is there room for a three quarters between a half and one? Probably. I just haven't done that. The rest of the math on that, Jody and I haven't. We have though. I'm I'm looking at this right. graph. Can you pull up the graph that shows as a percentage? It's a vertical graph. The percentage of maneuver spreads. To me, that's. I mean, that was the first thing I thought of when I saw this graph because when you look at the finals, you have. Nope, the vertical one. I'm sorry, horizontal. I'm using the wrong language. <laughs> Sure. Yep. yep. Look at the finals. <laughs> the problem Good lies thing with you're the... not a, a bridge engineer, right? <laughs> if, right. Well, if you look at this final section, there were 96 horses. <laughs> 96 horses in the finals, and 35 percent of our finalists had a maneuver s- score spread of a one point differential. To me, that says. We need more than half point increments to work in because Jody, to your point, can't exist in three boxes. And and to take the tools that we have, you guys have done a great job of educating our industry on the fact that what that maneuver represents is a culmination of, right? Um, if you've got a um plus half, a plus one, and a plus one and a half, I'm using a three score system as it's probably an average of a plus one, right? You add three together and you divide by three. I get that from a conceptual perspective, but using all three maneuvers is confusing to our industry. It's confusing to our exhibitors. We shouldn't use three boxes. We maybe need more boxes, right? Or boxes that are between those boxes that aren't so significant. Yes, on the specific tool. I'm going to answer it simply because then, and we're not going to be able to go here now. Jody and I have been doing 20 years of research. Do we have, we've found what we believe is certainly the best next move. We've already found that. It's not the only one. Mm-hmm. So the rest of the conversation is, it's not the only one. The conversation is the depth, of, the depth and volume of competition and our purse money and the rest of the business and economics are now in our sport. That is the need to necessarily move in that direction and tools in the toolbox as well as, and I love it, Jody's brought up a big one, which is the working group. You know, advancing a level of officials that now are focused on only that, and now you work with that same group and led by a coach that's going to advance everybody, which is, and there's that does nothing but advance the sport, but it's about the competitor and where we started, which is, Jody made reference to handing out because ours is prize money. So first place and now 30th place in the fraternity is significant because you're now in, you know, two and six figure dollars. Mm -hmm. So these are real, you know, the difference between 25 and 50 bucks was real, but it's, it's now you're talking 50,000 and a hundred thousand and 20,000 and 50,000. It's yeah. Let me pose this last question I, to you guys on this particular topic. Gracious. Oh, go ahead, Jody. Go ahead. No, no. I, I was just, I was just going to say that you know when when we talk about this and you know, like I said, you know, Brian and I have we studied it extensively and we've had this conversation before on Rainer Stop. You have to look no further than the Run for a Million, the first two of them. They, you know, we had ties, right? I mean, ties to win. Uh, and what a fifteen horse field, and we have ties to win. It's like. You can't have ties to win out of 15 horses. I mean, it's like figured out. And But, you know, let's say that, you know, in our futurity finals, they were so good, right? I mean, and those horses are so close. We we talked about this, the difference between Sean and Casey is what? what a, a point? I, I can't remember what there was. I mean, it's a, one point? It was a, and, a half a point, one maneuver. Half a point, one maneuver. Right. Exactly. So, and what happens when we have, you know, you have multiple ties, you know, for third through sixth, it's like those horses can and must be separated. Okay. So we're, we're ready. Mm -hmm. We have what we believe. So anyways, because we've tested a number of ways. So, and no, just dropping the, I would tell you, just dropping the high and the low on a five-judge system is 
not enough. It would do something at the aged events, and I'm going to actually pull backwards. I'm going to look at 2022 and do just on the finals of our aged events and just do the math on a, you know the three-judge drop high and low versus if all five scores, and I'll do that. But he's correct because we tie too much, and the ties itself say that our system won't make the fine distinctions. Right. Not that I'm forcing myself back on another show, but if you guys want to philosophically talk about dropping the highs and lows, I just... We won't go there today. I just think it's a fascinating topic to talk about when we think about advancing our... It'd be an easy one right now. It's easy. And is it mathematically true that more data endpoints give you a more significant number? Yes, it is. That'd be easy. You could do it for just the fraternity and the derby if you want. Look at the numbers, yeah. And look at the numbers and see. Sure. Last question for today's topic. Because I want to get your perspective and give some insight to our exhibitors, our horsemen and women of the industry. And I don't know the perfect way to phrase this question, so I will let you guys sort of digress on this topic however you so see fit. But degree of difficulty obviously continues to go up, and of course it goes up across our set of finals as well. Um, Where credit comes from, where removing credit comes from. We've talked about that from the rule book perspective of things, but we obviously are seeing from a statistical perspective, our judges have a hard time of picking two boxes, right? That's what we've talked about today. From an exhibitor's perspective, what would you guys like to empower them with from an educational perspective on understanding the role of degree of difficulty and how it plays out on the scorecard and what they can be doing to to do that because not only are we seeing the statistics, right, and we've got these big sets of differentials, but we also, I believe, are in a time in our industry where style is more diverse than ever. And the way for exhibitors to show something to us is quite diverse. And thinking about where a standard is and the fact that maybe we're not all clear on what the standard is as an exhibitor, you know, what would you tell our exhibitors if you had if you had them all listening to this episode? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in real fast before, because you said something significant. I would actually say the contrary to it. We do not see a diverse style. Mm. Jody and I used to see a diverse style in our time, because whether you were from the upper Midwest or the East Coast or the West Coast or Texas, Oklahoma or wherever – you could tell where somebody was from by the style at which they trained and showed their horses. You are not seeing that diversity today. They are all trying to diversely put themselves in the same style. Okay. That's what I would tell you, Um, which is the flat top lines, low heads, that whole kind of thing. We've been in this fashion statement for a while. That's where the style's sane that everybody's trying to be in. But we aren't seeing a vast diversity in style of exhibition. We used to, but we don't. That's fair. That's fair. And I didn't live back in your early time, so I only have what I have now. And so for me, I do see style differentials, but you're right, because when you watch those runs from 10, 15, 20 years ago, they are quite different. I am thinking, though, about, you know, as an exhibitor, um, and, and we talked about this a little bit on the Futurity episode a few weeks ago. You know, I asked about... Um, as an exhibitor, right, and and seeing these score differentials, what do you do with that? Well, we understand that when they see their scores, they can think about a culmination of those scores. But when we think about um, what they should be doing in exhibition, right, earning credit, not earning credit, degree of difficulty, and across those maneuver spreads, anything that you guys would tell our, our horsemen and horsewomen as they try and go compete at the highest level for now six-figure purses? Well, it's... The, the style, and you had asked the question when we did the fraternity analysis, so for the audience that may look at that, which was about the responsibility of the competitor and how they display their skill, which this is a control game, versus the officials and their responsibility of evaluating how good the skill is. And and I played a little bit of a cop-out on that one because I didn't approach it. Well, I should have. That's just me, but and the point is that exhibitors have a wide range of responsibility and choices by which they choose to, one, train and to exhibit the control game of reigning. The judges have a standard by the association 
that moves over time, and they're supposed to be evaluating quality against that standard, against the style exhibited. That's the real answer to that whole piece. And that's always moving, and Jody talks about it all the time because quality of breeding, genetics, quality of livestock, skill, length of time these guys have to... I mean, we used to think that, you know, April and May, three-year-olds were... We had lots of time. Those days are gone. So, you know, they know that in their two-year-old year. So it's... Yeah. Doug? Yeah, I mean, I that's I, I can't add any more to that. Chelsea, if I if I still had a barn full of non pros that were you know was hauling to some major events and you know I and I, I I don't want this show to come across as as me being down on NRHA judges. It's the greatest system in the world. These guys do a phenomenal job. The fraternity got the heck judged out of it. It, 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 even with the maneuver evaluation differences that we saw, it still was a hell of a judged horse show. So it's not, I, 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 I this is not, this, this show is about for me and, and I'll, it, it's about making what's good even better. It's not about coming down on, on a system that's, that's not the way we want it to. It works. It really does work. It can be made better. So I would, you know, I mean, I, the first thing, it's just like a trainer instead of a judge. I'm going to go, you know, first of all, you got to show your horse. It's like a golfer, you know, he's got to beat the course. He's not beating the guy that he's playing against unless it's match play. But I mean, he's, he's trying to beat the golf course. You guys are going to go out there, show the judge your horse, stay out of the penalty box. It, don't go fast unless you can handle going slow. And, that's how I'm going to say that that's how I want my people to go show. And those judges are going to be able to handle that also. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got some unbelievably good judges that can separate horses. We're just, we just want to make it, to make what's good even better than it is. And I think that there's a lot of room for that to happen. So I don't know if that helps you or not, but anyway. It certainly does. I think as we talk on our next episode because we'll speak about rollbacks and circles which are some of the most difficult maneuvers and why and And yeah and jody's right i mean we're not trying to be bashing it we're actually very proud of being part of that i mean him and i were in the first class of the system that we now know that the whole horse world has adapted some part of it so i mean we're extremely proud and where it's actually about thinking about how we can all help make it better. All we're identifying is some of that struggling. You know, if, if I was having a hard time with a horse, I'd be calling Jody first saying, I need help. So it's the same thing. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much exactly. for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. It is always a joy. <laughs> yep. Thanks, Jody. We'll see you soon. <laughs> Yeah, oh, thank you guys. Chelsea, you're awesome as usual. Brian, you too. I, I so appreciate it. And thanks everybody for watching. Yep. Till next time. Today's episode is brought to you by 4D Productions in cooperation with the Consultment Agency, a full-service agency that helps bring forward-thinking equine brands into the 21st century using digital skills and services such as website development, graphic design, social media, and media production such as the podcast you're consuming here today. Thank you so much for riding along with us today. Sign up at cowboyoffice.com to be the first to know about topics affecting the industry we love so much. You can reach out to us with topics you care about by finding us on TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and all podcast platforms. And remember, share this episode with someone that may enjoy it, because the more we can share our horses with others, the better our world will be.